What's up? This is Matthew with Wheel Talk Seattle and Colin. Yo, and, what's up, guys? And Reed Olofsson. And our guest, Reed. Hey, friends. Awesome. We're here to talk about a project you two have been working on. Uh, Reed, you've been you made a, a comic, graphic novel. Sure. Is it okay to call it a comic? It is okay to call it a comic. I, I think as I get older, I lean more into that term. I feel like, uh, especially in the early aughts, like the term people just start when comics became cool again or acceptable. I feel like the term graphic novel got a little pretentious, but yeah, comics is uh, se se sequential storytelling with art. So I, yeah, I, I lean in pretty hard to comics. That's the term. Good. All right. Well, comics then. And comics. the, the title is, I'm blanking. <laughs> it's writers in a main cage. The uh, yeah. I don't blame you. The um, my handwriting is chicken scratch, um, and I intentionally got a little off the rails in writing it uh, on the front cover there. Yeah, very uh, yeah. A, little, a little bit of rough sudden maybe. Yeah, Reed and I have been working on this awesome comic. It's been great to work. With. We did uh, some video collaboration, and um, it happened to have some bikes as some of the storylines. So. Of course, we got into it, shared it with Matthew, and um, here we are. You want to tell us a little bit about what what we're doing here? What's going on? Well, I shared the comic with you, and I was thinking about, I've been working on this project for, if I'm being honest, about five years now. Um, and eventually it was like, I need, to, I need to bring this thing to life. Um, I've had it in different forms of finished for way too long. And when it came time to making, I was like, okay, how am I going to bring it to life? Well, I'll do Kickstarter. And then it was like, well, how am I going? You just reminded me, uh, back it up. I met you at a coffee shop and uh, yeah, you'd so, just be scribbling away, doodling. And yeah, we'll, 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 yeah. Yeah, we'll backpedal all the way. Um, yeah. yeah, we met at a coffee shop because we, we had a mutual friend working um, next door at a bike shop. And then we just started hanging out, um, going on bike rides, living. Talking about the, bikes. Talking about bikes. Um, Taking pictures with bikes. <laughs> living the Seattle dream, you know. Cranksgiving 2019. Crank, Cranksgiving, yes, yes. Um, and we found out about your involvement with the bikery. Mm -hmm, uh, yeah. We'll talk a little bit about that on this show. Yeah. Uh, we, go on. Well, I guess, well, let's start there. What, what do you do with the bikery? I found the bikery in 2016. Um, the bikery is on Hiawatha Street in Seattle. It's a 100% volunteer-run nonprofit bicycle shop, bicycle kitchen. It's a sliding scale uh, education center, so no one's ever turned away. Uh, and you can come there and work on your bike. It's a fully stocked shop, and we have all the tools you need. And we also take donations and we build up bikes to sell them to uh, people for below market prices. Awesome. Oh yeah. I've been there. It is definitely below market prices, but you can find just about <laughs> anything there. I mean, we'll have, we'll have some gyms occasionally that will, you know, mark up, you know, we got to make rent too, but uh, yeah. Um, you know, trying, trying to not have burner bikes in there, but, you know, they show up every every spring, regardless. Yeah, last time I was there, I asked if we could uh, cut a tandem bike in half, and we were this <laughs> close to doing it too. Oh yeah, yeah, I rem I do remember that that one. Yes, um, we've had a few tandem donations from time to time, but I think that one was particularly janky. Did yeah. Did you ride that one, Matt, or did Did Reed take that one first? Then I can't remember. I think we tried to take it for a spin and oh, okay. it did not seem safe. <laughs> not roadworthy. That's fair. Not yet. Cool. Well, thanks for telling us about the bikery. Um, 
So fast forward a couple couple more steps. We've been riding riding around for a year, and uh, it, you've told me about this this comic book that was on online and digital copy, and uh, bringing things to life, and and in the spirit of well, tell us about the message. Like I think it's super cool, and um, and I think Matt's gonna love it. Uh, bikes and friends, and yeah, let, let, let's just let's fucking dive into it. Yeah, uh, farms, farms, bikes, and glory. The uh, story is a. I've been told to use the term semi autobiographical, although it kind of feels a little weak off the tongue. It's like I feel it's more of um lived experiences uh, thrown into a blender set on high. It's um about yeah three friends focusing on the main character Riley and their adventures uh, returning back to the East Coast after walking away from their first big farm project. And it's about leaning in on friendships and riding your bikes around uh, to stay mentally healthy when everything feels like garbage. Um, It's about climate grief. Uh, It's about growing up uh it's about heavy feels um you know this is why you and i worked so hard on the uh trailer and uh, a lot of friends gave me some really really valuable insight into how to write the elevator pitch um i can feel myself stumbling right now because like it's it's my story i'm i'm so in it yeah uh you know i can easily miss the the forest the trees so Another reason why it was really great to, you know, work with you on this project, um, to, to make something that was um, digestible for everyone. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Ghost Teeth, we uh, you reached out to them and got permission to use their song "Local Seattle" by Keep Rockers and by Keep Punk Rockers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It just I was, um, yeah. Their album came out what two time man? Okay, two years ago. Whenever. I don't know, but it came out and I was like, right about the time it came out, I was like thinking like what would be a good musical choice for, for the Kickstarter. And for a minute, for, as a placeholder, I had Against Me's uh, Joy in my head because it's also a short song. Um, but then I heard Shoot the Moon and it was just like, this is perfect. Like I, the whole point is I want to work with my friends and this is the, I think that had <clears throat> the, there is like an equivocation of like, how literal do I want to be with the music? But there is, the, I really like, like we talked about, I mean, there's the space theme that we all love, but the mm-hmm. feeling of like burning up on reentry of like having some life experiences that, that at least for the moment afterwards, like you still feel like the residual effects of, and it, it makes you, uh, real life doesn't register the same way. You you feel like kind of out of touch and you're trying to search for what that new normal is as you settle in. And that's kind of what mm-hmm. at least book one is about, I think, um, most succinctly, is like settling back into something that's uncomfortable and trying, scrambling to like find some, some sense of steady and comfort. Um, and they use the bikes to do that. Okay. <clears throat> I was going to ask about that how your relationship with bikes kind of comes through in your comic. Bikes are fun and bikes, uh, bikes provide a lot of that, like that pow and visual um, draw that, that comics offer. I think like, so I grew up reading comics, love, love comics. Um, I think like growing up reading Spider-Man, I think you're attracted to it for like the human form and like the body doing these like amazing feats um, that, and you don't think you really contemplate as a kid, the like sometimes ultra violence that's involved. Um, Mm -hmm. But, and I did, those weren't, I love superhero stories much of my, um, morality is, is based on them but i those aren't the stories that i wanted to tell I, i've seen that movie before so to speak 
Um, but I think, you know, again, lived experiences, but also I think bicycles, bicycles are kind of the superpower. They, they give you the ability to like move quickly um, and, and see the world differently. And again, they're like, there's a sweet spot of like, there's this like, this like super elegant machinery that like humans built. So, and there's like a classical element of it. So it's like, it's like cars, but the engine is you. So it's in my mind, far more interesting of a story to tell. Um, yeah. I think this, it's just like, it just, I think the bicycle begs the, the best parts of ourselves and it's just a really cool way to be in the world. And, um, literally it's like it was just a cool vehicle to use to tell a story yeah so kind of yeah. along those lines um it's an ultra i mean you rode across the country yourself and have gone on multiple bike tours for multiple days and weeks at a time and that's mm-hmm. something i've been dreaming of and have accomplished a few times and overnights and a couple day trips but how does that and i've seen you know re, going through chapter one that's that's a huge part you know the, the journey and it the time is in in defined is not really defined in between in between stops and you know doing some short tours i kind of there's a it evoked that feeling of like timelessness when you're on the bike and uh and that the the healing power of the machine i suppose totally in some um, ways yeah you're right there is uh especially chapter 1 um there's like discussions about time and memory and yes, particularly what draws me, like I ride a bike through Seattle day in, day out because it's fun. But like particularly, I think one reason I've been bike touring now for like 10 years plus is that the when you like moving through the world on a bike, um, it like when you're just in the journey, it's like uh, it's not that like the the weekly 24 hour structure that we have is wrong, but it's like, it's, it's good to check out of that and experience time in like a different way. Um, and I've never, I haven't had that happen in another means of travel. So sure. another reason I keep coming back to the bike. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I wanted to check in. I see. You know, I, I don't see a bikes very much in, say, like mainstream entertainment or arts, mm-hmm. but mostly in like uh, independent producers of entertainment or art. Now, why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, it's still like an underground thing? If it is, like you're saying, it is, because even when I put on my helmet and get it on the saddle, I do feel like I do have like a cape. I feel super awesome. I like yeah. think about how my bike <laughs> looks. I feel more powerful on it. Oh, How come man. more people, I don't know why others don't like uh, make more art and entertainment that has like, within them. Great question. Um, to the extent that I'm equipped to like properly answer that. I don't know how far do you want to go back in history? I mean, um, you guys, uh, I'm going to plug uh, the artist. She was based in Seattle. The artist Tessa Halls. Um, who you should definitely have on your podcast at some point, another fantastic artist um, who has done a lot of writing presentation on bikes. Uh, she's given a talk through BikeWorks um, and Swift about particularly the bike's impact on like women's empowerment and freedom throughout history. But circling back to your question, yeah, um, you know, how I think there's most simply, there's just been more money put to put to advertising cars um, as a cultural touchstone. And, you know, I, I, I'm certainly down to go after the narratives, but like, I think ideas of like, you know, if, if you, it's, it just was never equated with the idea of success. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to address it again, lived experiences I'll address in like further issues of this story. But like, I have literally been pulled over in the middle of a Vermont winter and asked by strangers, like, why are you doing this? Like, do you have a DUI? Which is an incredibly strange, inappropriate way to like 
open a conversation with a stranger, but it was that like, like, like if you're not, there's still, I think are, I don't, that narrative, it kind of falls apart in Seattle, but there's still like, there's still like, it's, you know, whether or not we believe it, it's still in, um, it's still in us. And I think people do wonder like, well, just get a job and get a car hippie, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, is reductive and boring, but you know, maybe that's, maybe that's why. Um, uh, maybe so. I, when I was at the short run, I look out for bike comics, uh, and, uh, Mm-hmm. I'll find at least one a year for sure. I think it, it is, it is more like, I don't know, more people need to experience it, but also like a diverse voices need to be like, I don't know, experiencing it too. I think, I think the, the bicycle, uh, and you're right. It, it is really exciting, particularly going to short run and every year seeing more and more artists, uh, incorporating the bike in storytelling. I think, it's, you know, um, I think mo- like people older than us think of bikes and they think of like the tour or it's like a racing thing. It's, it's not uh, an egalitarian tool that you use for day in, day out living. It's not part of, it's not necessary for living. Um, whereas like, you know, if you took my bike away, I'd be like, you know, cold and naked in the woods, just useless. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's really it's really cool, and I think also what's cool at Short Run is to see you know artists that don't look like me writing and drawing about their experiences on bicycles. For sure, for sure. That's it. that's interesting. I moved to Seattle about ten years ago from uh, the middle of the country, and um, that's it's kind of it resonates with me that like when you have a DUI that. The, <laughs> I've heard that a right? few times and it, and it is, it is a lot better here in Seattle. Um, the people are more tolerant. Uh, the extension of that I think is, what do you mean you ride your bike everywhere? Do you have a driver's license or, you know, yeah. and, I, and I've, I've caught myself like, no, I do have a drive, you know, volunteering that no, I have a driver's license. I drive sometimes I prefer to get around this way. There's really no reason not to get around this way. And before we didn't, we, you know, did, we had to stay inside. The traffic was nuts. Like it was the best way to get around. I mean, transit's pretty good, but like the bike yeah. was it most, uh, uh, most consistent anyway. And I like, I value consistency over speed for sure. And often you are faster anyway. Exactly. Exactly. And those are the, those are the bonus points. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. When I was, you know, living, uh, in the Northeast, um, this is the first city I've ever lived in. Um, you know, I could see, I understood that like, okay, if I'm going to be biking like 10 or 16 miles one way to a job back and forth, like this is, this is me, this, like, I clearly love cycling. So that's, I mean, I don't expect everyone to do it. And there are, you know, obviously very clear barriers as to why not everyone rides their bike in the city. But when I moved to Seattle, I'm like, saw the traffic in gridlock myself then it was that really does beg the question like why doesn't everyone ride their bike this looks terrible um Mm -hmm. and yeah we try to address some of those problems of uh, access to biking bicycling at the bikery um oh cool yeah yeah yeah, there are there are good forces at work but yeah it, it it does um yeah seattle traffic is nuts and mm-hmm. we're not we as a government are not doing enough to deal with it. Um, and especially now that there are less cars in the road, it's now is now's the time now more than ever. Yeah. Get a bike if you can. It's so, a so tangentially related infrastructure question. Do you have a favorite greenway or bike route in Seattle? Well, maybe, set, maybe one of each because greenways <laughs> and bike routes are maybe not mutually exclusive. <laughs> I, hmm, hmm. I'm so I'm Beacon Hill. So the Chief South Trail yeah. is gorgeous. Um, you know, even on a semi cloudy day, you can kind of catch glimpses of Rainier, and uh, especially for bike touring, I appreciate it as a easy way to like 
head south and you know south around the lake or just get out of the city towards um the big mountains um so that's that's pretty special to me um yeah what about you guys have the you newest been? one that's built i like that one the most the newest one that's built <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah um, I'm gonna go which one that is one that Matthew time. which one is it <laughs> I'll probably right now is like fourth avenue actually it's not my favorite but it's still <laughs> pretty nice you know now that it's brand new the one they built on dearborn two years ago mm -hmm. uh was much appreciated i could especially could be uh in the international district and grab some noodles and then quite uh with great peace of mind and safety ride up towards the bikery. Yeah. Yeah. That goes right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think they recently refreshed the intersections underneath I five too, to make them more safe and have dedicated bike lights as well, which is phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, peace of mind is a top factor for me for, um, for like the common routes that I take and, uh, I just moved to Capitol Hill recently and I'm finding out which side streets are the least bumpy with the least amount of elevation gain. So that's, that's been my jam for the last couple months. You live on the side of a hill and you're looking for least elevation gain. That's, that's I'm looking, okay. Let me clarify. I'm looking for trolley routes. I'm, uh, I'm yeah, looking yeah, yeah. for railroad grade. I'm looking for non cobblestones. Um, <laughs> that's fair. Okay. Fair. Fair. All right. Got a few. It's it's good. You know, even before I, I moved here, people were telling me about the trolleys and like the hills. And it's like I can't imagine why people would ride their bike in Seattle with all the hills. It's crazy. But you know, I I've talked to you know enough people, at least just my own experience, uh, sam my own sample size of talking to people about biking who are just even like you know mildly interested. It's it's but it's not the hills it's it's the i don't feel safe part mm -hmm. um yeah. and i've definitely thought about you know i've thought about like the conditions that you know i'm certainly a product of my parents and who are adventurous um and i got to grow, grow up riding a bike but you know i've been i've been i grew up in an area that was safe to walk and ride a bike and i think about how much that impacted my or informed my sense of adventure, what was, what was safe or what I could do. And I had, I had some, uh, you know, those big aha moments, particularly biking around in the Southern States, uh, Florida, I'm going to hate on you a little bit right now. Um, you know, these, these areas that, I mean, Florida should be like a biking Mecca. It's, it's flat as a pancake and you can wear a t-shirt all year round and it's fine. Um, but, you know, I almost was killed twice in one week in Miami on a bike, you know, um, and whether it's like infrastructure or just like culture, you know, I've had, I've had people occasionally try to run me off the road, like not seriously, but like just, you know, veer, veer their cars just like way too close and, and you know, they're doing it. I like doing, they're doing like this and it's like, that's not really cool because I'm just flesh. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's there's the physical infrastructure, but there's the there's also the, the cultural zeitgeist um, of like, do I do cyclists belong to be on the road? Are roads for more than just cars? Like these are bigger questions, and that's why you know I appreciated biking in Vermont and upstate New York, because even though there were not you know designated bike lanes, there I think there was an understanding that roads for everyone. And, and that just gave me a sense of safety that was, you know, very much appreciated. And I, yeah, I mentioned that a little bit in the comic. There's, um, there's definitely uh, a car of younger privileged kids that harass the riders um, in and out. And that it's definitely like, that is, I'm not, I'm not making that stuff up. That stuff has all happened 
to me and us, you know, multiple times. Um, and I think it's like a, an, an important piece to tell um, in, in the story of like cycling in this country right now. Mm. Yeah. Have you yeah, even guys, the title? Oh, have you guys felt safer, or like what's, or have you felt? How has your sense of safety changed since you guys lived in Seattle? As as people who communicate on two wheels. Ah, great question. Turning the questions think, back at you guys. I think my quick answer for that is I realized or became aware of. Um, a few things. At first, I realized I knew how to ride a bike and I was pretty okay at it. However, I hadn't done it forever and I was really, it, it was a lot scarier than I remember in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, it was also motivating in a sense, like, um, like I, I, I could actually do this. Like, I want to get to that level of being able to ride in traffic. And, and I, I think it, you described it, that sense of adventure and that, like, well, this is hard, but this is going to be fun if I keep trying it. And it's going to be, you know, yeah, best way to get around town. I just, there were enough benefits that it's like, I can see how this could come together. And, you know, you just keep working at it. And, and that's, <laughs> you get to this certain point where I realized, well, I am more fearless than a lot of people. And yeah. how do we, you know, where do we make decisions and how do we align to, yeah, it's, it's, super, it's interesting seeing both sides of that side. Yeah, that and I'm super glad you're able to push through and hit hit that like that point of comfort. But like you can, I can, you can see you're like, you know, I've definitely been in areas. I remember biking through Florida and being like, "How do you learn to ride a bike here?" And it's like the answer mm -hmm. is like you don't, mm -hmm. you don't. Like I think it's like that might add answer more to the question of like your Matt your earlier question of like why are why are cars portrayed more in 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 film and media is just because like you know at least now we that's you know our understanding of, of film and media relies on, on like shared experiences and the bike is a less shared experience um hmm. perhaps than so, you know a car yeah yeah okay so independent like i guess underground independent like uh producers or creators of art are it's because uh with with cycling in regard is because cycling is more underground than anything else like like you say some places yeah. you're not even meant to go anywhere by bike like no. if you are you go onto the sidewalk and some places it's even illegal to ride on the sidewalk yeah you shouldn't ride on the sidewalk you shouldn't have to ride on the sidewalk but yes <laughs> i've, I've, I've yeah. been there <laughs> yeah yeah exactly Oh man. Yeah. You know, I feel I've definitely seen a change here in Seattle. Once you see, uh, I think, uh, like, you know, parents riding their kids in their, on their cargo bike around, that's like a signal to everybody. Like, Hey, you know, everybody's riding their bike around. At least a lot of people are all kinds of people are. So chill out, you know, you don't want to hit your coworker and then on your way to work. Yeah. Yeah. Or the person you're going to see in class that day. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely changed here. But I think also, like Colin was saying, I don't know if it's just me or I've just gotten more confident slash reckless and <laughs> I'm not as worried anymore. <laughs> there, there's, there's, part of, worry. there's part of me that, like I, there are moments, you know, there are moments I just want to, you know, get from point A to point B and, and go home and take a nap. But like there, and there are days like I want to send it and get wild and crazy. And, and th those are all really important, but I think, yeah, um, I forget, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but she is, or was the, the planner in New York city for bike infrastructure. And like, yeah, their metric mm -hmm. of success was like our families riding their bikes you know, mm -hmm. are the people with most to lose using this form of transportation. I think with, that's a very good and telling, you know, metric to look at. Um, uh, I think, especially now when most more people are using their bikes, I think, I feel in general, the trail etiquette's been pretty good, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I remember being on the trail first riding around, not without, without a light, 
And oh, no. I, was not, I was not, yeah, well, <laughs> it's gotten, it's gotten better. Uh, at least when people don't have lights, you know, I know not to yell something at them because maybe they don't have a light. <laughs> maybe they don't have, maybe they can't buy a light. Maybe they don't know. They've never bought a light before. I, I think uh, in a city with, with so much wealth inequality, that's a really important point. Um, and, and it's a reason I feel, you know, pretty, even though the bike rate needs to make rent, I, I feel very compelled to like keep prices um, as low as possible because we're a nonprofit and we don't get the big bank bonus payouts. But like, yeah, if you, like, if you know, if you know you like biking, then four or $500, it might be worth it for a part or a, a bike. But like, there are a lot of people that like, maybe I want to try this out, but like, I can't afford lights nonetheless. Like, I'm not sure if I want a bike. Like that's a lot of my paycheck. Yeah. I think, um, it's the same reason I have mixed feelings, but generally I'm not not pro mandatory helmet laws. Um, yeah, neither am I. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's good to see Cascade uh, by Bicycle Club retract there. They advocated for the the law. Now I think yeah. they're working to to repeal it. So that's news to me. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it may have been on the DL. Whoops. I don't know. But anywho, yeah. the point the point is we'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah, I'll keep an eye out. But in general, yeah, I think these these barriers to access, um and it is I think I think it just goes to think about like, you know, we all carry stories and instead of like especially when you know you know, I mean, you all are familiar with the term cagers and the idea of like when you're in a car, like you are you're in your own little protective bubble, but like, mm-hmm. I, I do like, you know, when, when you're on a trail, like, yeah, etiquette m- matters more. Cause we're not, we're not protected by metal and like we're passing by each other and they might be our neighbors and we, we make eye contact and there's this very like human to human interaction, which is, you know, should be a, a positive thing in a city. I mean, we got to be careful with that now, which is why we're on a zoom call, but like, yeah, mm-hmm. instead of being like, oh, why is this person being inconsiderate and doesn't have their lights? Well, like maybe they can't afford lights. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe or they're just... riding on the sidewalk. Well, because there isn't a bike lane nearby. Because there isn't a bike lane. <laughs> or maybe they just had a really long day and mm-hmm. forgot to charge their lights last night. I think um, there. I think the, the vulnerability of cycling can, more often than not, knock on wood, be a means of like expanding your patience and compassion for people. Here's to hope. Yeah, yeah. The thank you. And the uh, the helmet law kind of reminded me of something and you're, you're asking what I've learned and the helmet's a great uh, prop for the for illustrating something I've learned and it's for safety. I grew up and I had to wear a helmet when I was biking. It was not the law, but it was required in my family. And I hated every minute of it because <laughs> no, none of my friends on the block, you know, I got made fun of merciless grow oh, up. Fast forward 50 years. You know, and I just told the story about how terrified I was when I realized I wasn't as good at riding a bike as I thought I was when I wanted to start it up again. So a helmet was my safety net. And, you know, then I hit this point of realization where I am more confident. I'm like, well, I don't need a stinking helmet because I'm more, you know, confidence is safer than I don't, you know, Mm-hmm. you have a couple of close encounters and then you realize that it's not for your, you know, it's not because of your skills. It's to prevent, you know, and it's not because of any stinking law either, because yeah, there's way too many, it just creates way too many barriers and obstacles and um, puts yeah. the cyclist at fault in case, you know, in the event they couldn't afford a helmet and they, yeah, it's, we'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should wear a helmet if you can, but it should not be the only thing. Did you guys see, I could probably dig it up because we should, if I'm going to talk about it, we should link to it. But uh, someone shared a video, maybe future crystals on Instagram about there was a, do you see this? The the real change, the person for real change was hit in Soto. Um, And what you just said, like the, the, I mean, the body cams and the footage, it's like, I'm going to have to be careful. I'm going to get real wound up, but like just the way they, they immediately tried to blame the writer for the accident 
uh, and like, did they have a helmet? Is this bike stolen? I'm just like, ACAB, fuck you, buddy. This is why we hate you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a lot. Um, I read the article. It was terrible. I haven't seen the video yet. I was uh, in a triggered state of mind when I read it, and I'm I'm almost there, but it's, it's gonna make your blood boil. Potent. Yeah, um, and that's what I was afraid of. So I'm like, I need to chill for a second and think about it <laughs> before I watch this. Um, but yeah, it's oh god. <laughs> uh, we'll link to that. We'll I'll find the link and make sure that we link to that when we broadcast or uh, put this up. So yeah, timely. Thank yep. you. I went on a tweet storm that night because of that video. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just sent an email to representatives after that. I'm like, this is BS, you guys. Obvious, like so many levels of that video were wrong. Just assuming the bike was stolen, that's, that, that, blaming that's, it yeah. on a person. And then what? What was just like? It was like first thing the officer asked, oh, they, "Were they well in a helmet?" Literally, like the first thing they asked. How Can't about how about this operator of like a ton and a half of steel just hit a fellow human being? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, forest through the trees. Um, yeah, I was. Yeah, speaking of, you know, uh, man, I go back and forth. I use Soto uh, to go back and forth down to to Georgetown. Um, and that's an area that I'd love to see more bike paths. I like biking on six. Uh, I mm -hmm. found that to be the the safest. Is that the Greenway? Is it? I mean, if it is, it it's kind like, of winds through, or if it and it might not be clearly marked, but I'd kind of through those neighborhoody areas. And once once you go over the bridge into Georgetown, because it gets cut off by by the, by the train tracks, so mm -hmm. and you go over the bridge and then dip to your heading south you dip to your you're right then yeah it yeah it goes through neighborhoods and it's, and it's really nice um yeah but going from the uh international district through soto there's uh i found it to be a the best road and just like the least sketchy um there are enough stop signs and it's uh, yeah, you can't get going too fast, and there's still enough space for like all the semis and mm -hmm. truck traffic's a big concern. And yeah, that kind of plays into our fearless rider thing. In in some senses, like it, it's it's interesting how we individually gauge these routes, it's, and it's fun to talk about. So mm -hmm. that, that's cool. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to get ideas of like how can we pull our um, if we could rank these routes and we could provide different data to the city because. That'd be a fun. That'd be fun. Like ranking like a your, social experiment. <laughs> Rank your right. Well, I mean, Strava does that, or I don't know. I don't use those apps. I can't. I can never remember to start it before I start my ride, and I ride a lot. And it's I'm TTA. I'm glad things like Strava exist. Mm -hmm. I guess. Um, Same. But cool. it's really it's yeah. I think that's kind of just like cool. Like I don't know. I had. <laughs> God. God bless him. And he was a he was a good strong rider, but like I had someone ask me once, um, in regards to like my bike history, like what's my resume, which just mm -hmm. hit me all kinds of the wrong way, and it was it was it was a cringing moment. Um, it just felt, I mean, it's again, it's like uh, so much of like how I think how we're conditioned to like express our affection or excitement for something and activity is to like commodify it and be like, and also like, I don't know. I think we're also just so conditioned to living online that like we post all these. Greatest like, achievements. Look, look, and, yeah. yeah. Look at, look at this ride. It did. It's like, woo, cool. Wow. <laughs> um, it, and I, it's, it's weird. Cause I, I, and maybe I grew up um, on a fairly aggressive sports team and I think I, I grew up riding a bike my whole life, but I think when I hit my 20s, I like really started to lean in on the bicycle was I wanted an outlet to like use my body and have fun. And like, I'm just a little tired of measuring myself all the damn time. So uh, mm -hmm. I myself just eye roll left and right when people want to talk about those metrics. I'm just like, well, cool, I have a peanut butter sandwich. You want to go to Bainbridge? <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> 
that just, yeah. And I love doing, I also, like, I love just like getting brave and crazy and riding all day and all night. Um, but probably I'm going to, I'm going to pull up the photo cause I want, I, uh, we'll put it in the description. Cause like, it's, it's a, I should really have my wallet just to like show people all the time, but it's, uh, the craziest tour I ever went on in terms of like miles. We average probably a hundred miles a day when I biked out here with a friend from college and it was not the best gear. It was like, you know, kitty litter boxes and just, you know, things held together with shoestrings, literally. Uh, but you know, at the end, at the end of the day, again, going back to like Strava or just measuring things in gear and what's most important, like it's, it's your heart, not your gear, you know, like the gear is important. Cause like inherently, like you are, you need a bike to, to ride a bicycle and that is important. Uh, and you should have brakes and good tires, but you know, um, as a wise sage once told me, all bikes are good. Um, that's, I, I think about that a lot. Cool. Do you, yeah. you, you, say you have the picture? Do you, can you like hold up the picture or something if you have it with you? No. If I send it to you, can you throw it up on the, uh, let me see if I can do this. It's a great picture. It's, we were, my buddy Drew, shout out to Drew. He was, we crossed, um, we were just riding up, heading north. We came up from Taos following the Pecos River and we just crossed into Chicago. No, sorry, whoa, 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 brain fart. She crossed into Colorado, words. Crossed into Colorado and it was, um, it was super epic. Um, one of the, better pictures that I've ever taken. But I think in, especially in the age of like bike packing and Instagram bike culture, it's like, I don't have the platform to like push back against that. And it's cool. Yeah. Gear. Wow. Flashy things. Woo. Mm -hmm. But I think that these are like things that are more subtly expressed in mink cage is yeah. Like it's your heart, not your gear, guys. Um, I think something Matt and I have related to is like you don't need uh, certain or certain gear to exercise. You can exercise in whatever you want. Like exactly, yeah, totally get right. it. Love it. Again, challenging these like you know narratives of like what is a barrier to mm -hmm. forever. Lots of bungee cords. Yeah, bungee yeah, cords for life. <laughs> A bungee corded a milk crate to the back of a rack and you know for my first or for Matt and I's first overnight I mean I realized quickly that, that wasn't the best way to go about it but it was a lot of fun and it worked so I mean it, yeah you just learn so much I don't know I feel like you learn so much every time that you do it and it's even more exciting like getting ready for you know once the first it's like oh that was fun uh, I can't wait for the next one because I'm gonna do 100,000 things different it's gonna be even more fun and I don't know. It's just, there's just something about it. It just keeps poking. Okay. I'm getting yeah. close. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. Getting there? No worries. Yeah. I'm yes. doing it with others too. That's the best. What is it? Let's see. All right. All right. Should I send it? Um, it's on Instagram. Should I send it to wheel talk or to Colin? Which, can you, uh, just, can you text it to me? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. That's, Cause I got iMessage pulled up. Let's see if we can pull this off. Thanks audience. Da, da, da. Just one you ever done any solo touring? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I love, I love me some solo touring. Um, they're both really special. I think, you know, I think the the ones I've done with with friends are more memorable because you have you know someone to bounce memories back and forth and, and inside jokes, and that's really important to me. But yeah, solo touring is is a blast um for uh, my birthday gift to myself for my 30th i um solo rode from 
I took the bus to North Bend, uh, east of Seattle, and rode out to Boise, Idaho, to paint a mural on a, at Freak Alley. Um, it was so much fun. I have, yeah, you, yeah, it's really important to have alone time, um, especially, especially in the woods with your bicycle. Yeah. You paint out in Freak Alley. Freak Alley, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. That's showing up. Oh, man. That's, I can see it. Can you guys see it? Yeah, let me spotlight this real quick. Cool. There it is. It's just a really, it's a, it's a beautiful picture. Um, yeah. Wait, that's you? That's no, you. That, that's my buddy no, Drew. You. That's my buddy okay. Drew. But um, that bike he's on is probably from the 70s. Nice. Um, there's just so much great, everything about this picture is just like, oh man, I want to cry. It's so beautiful. Um, we, he's got stickers on the cat litter box <laughs> from places we'd, we'd already traveled. It's like there are bungee cords. There's an inner tube holding it on that we went to a hardware store and got a shower rack, like a shower um, rack that holds like soap that you put on the bicycle rack. There's like a, ratty uh sleeping pad and i don't even know what the other uh, the other thing the other thing might actually be more of the shower rack on the other on the okay the on viewers the, oh. the viewers the viewers left side oh yeah. it's like a shower caddy yeah 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 that's the word for it but and and yeah no clips um just just dropping hammers on this <laughs> big beautiful expansive western road into the colorado rockies that's good. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those Rockies don't look uh, very. Uh, how was it going through those? It was. We did. Um, it was. It was fine. It was. It was. We did notice a. Uh, you know, we were we were pretty excited and chatty that day, and I do remember once we got, you know, around nine thousand, ten thousand feet, we we started talking less. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as the air was thin. A little short of breath. Yeah, yeah. a little short of breath. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we did we did go up and over uh, Rocky Mountain National Park in that tour. Not that day, but in that tour. I think that's the highest oh, paved road in the country. Um, what did you yeah. do for shelter? I didn't see a tent or anything. I was carrying the tent. Oh, okay. Um, okay. He was not carrying all the gear. But like you... Share the, share the load, yes. <laughs> share the load. Um, but yeah, just to go back to like... I had this great moment like talking to uh, an elderly man who was a coworker with my mom back in going back to that first question about like, you know, sometimes if you do want to, when you do want to do something and you like your mind sometimes will just, instead of like pro constructively problem solving, you just put up speed bumps, roadblocks in your mind about, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? And it's just like, well, maybe just do something smaller and just, like, it, it can be done. Um, and we were talking about like, you know, it, you, you can bike four seasons in, in the Northeast or in Seattle, you know, you just, there is some gear that is really important, but like, like lights or warm clothes or, you fenders. know, fenders, shout out to fenders. Yep. But, but yeah, I think, yeah, I just look at this photo and just think about how much like grit and and just like really intense woo energy is in it. And yeah, you know, um, sure, maybe it was harder, but I I think I don't think he had any. I probably he probably had more fun than than most people. You know, I've I've seen on a bicycle. Um, mm. and yeah, at some point, I guess I'd start to, yeah, I guess I just always have a desire. If I see people running in one direction, I just want to run the other way. But like, it's really cool how people are getting and gathering and talking about bikes online. But in some ways it's just like one eye roll for me after the next. It's like, wow, that cool. You have a thousand dollar, multi thousand dollar bike with and hardware that you took way into the woods. Cool. Um. Mm -hmm. yeah right this, yeah yeah so your your novel is not about like 
racing or about competition, about being the best or about improvement. It's about, yeah, it's about, it's, it's more about like, yeah, pushing it. And I'm more interested. What I like about the bike is there's even with friends, it's a lot of you time and I'm more interested in like the spaces travel in your, in your brain than like on the road, you know, you don't have to go, you don't have to bike across the country to have like, really intense powerful experiences you know yeah. um yeah i think it's really amazing and cool that for better or for worse like we live on a continent where like at least for us i can travel borders don't virtually don't exist like i can go we live in this collective of sovereign states and i can cross the borders and no people take will take my money and speak my language and no one asks why I'm there. I mean, unless I'm sometimes on a bicycle, people ask why you're there. And I understand there's a lot of privilege to be able to say that, but it's, you know, you, and if you can fight for the time off to to take those experiences, then, you know, by all means do it, but you can, you know, I think, you know, I've had, some of the coolest experience that I've had is, is, is waking up in like not the most glorious places, like waking up, you know, behind a shopping center or like in a playground uh, or, you know, in a, in, you know, buildings that are falling apart. Um, I think that's what Mink Cage is more about and finding like beauty and like a lot of purpose and meaning in that. Um, you don't have to, uh, traverse the biggest baddest most instagrammable thing to like have one hell of a time with your friends so true that's so true well with that do you want to should we take a look at this trailer have we not even watched the trailer yet well we just we 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 just been riffing i i watched it what is time? Yeah. This is a different media. media no, 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 no. Yeah. Let's wa- let's watch it together. I love that. Let's watch it together, and then uh, and then we'll, and I think we'll be about ready to wrap up. And yeah, yeah. cool. All right, let's uh, All right. focus. Have you ever felt the ground evaporate from underneath you, and free falling feels normal? Riders in a mink cage tells the story of Riley who is trying to find peace in a reality which feels increasingly slipping off the rails. With his two best friends and their bicycles, they set off in search of a new normal. Six years post the Great Recession, jobs are hard to come by and a sense of steady even harder. The story fiercely begs us to lean into our closest friendships through the more difficult chapters in our lives. Olsen combines atmospheric artwork with a complex yet accessible storytelling style to create a thoroughly engaging book. The goal of this Kickstarter is to print book one on hemp paper in the United States. Like the drills we did in NASA camp Perhaps we'll be remembered fondly Lost cosmonauts on Russian postage stamps Like Vonnegut said, out on the edge You can see all kinds of things you can't see from the center And they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger Ooh, That's not much good when you want to die Woo! Cool. When they say Dude, what doesn't I'm excited to get my copy. I've already... Well, you, is, is, yeah, I've pledged. Thank you. I'm expecting a signed copy. You will get a signed copy. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. Oh, yeah. And, uh, us, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was say, tell us, tell us the deets. Like, when, when does this thing wrap up, Reed? And where are you at? Like, 
I mean, we already know. Uh, I already know where you're at because we are seventy over seventy five percent funded. Uh, twenty two hundred goal. Uh, we got seven or eight days left, so over the halfway point, but uh, creeping in on the finish line. Um, yeah, got to get. Want to send a shout out to my sweetheart Jess for helping with that that elevator pitch. Um, and big shout out to you, Colin, and both y'all for doing this podcast. This has been a lot of fun and a dream of mine ever since, uh, I saw you guys, uh, interview the, the safe 35th folks. Um, it was cool to see that on the screen with y'all. Um, and yeah, uh, it's going to be printed, uh, regionally, uh, on hemp paper, um, it was another like hurdle and kind of headache logistical logistically to manage. But I felt like if I was going to be a control freak on this, you know, you know, super viscerally personal project, like I'm not going to pull my punches. And uh, yeah, I think the story is, is also about, you know, asking the questions of like trying to, you know, maybe another world is possible and maybe we could, do things better in different ways or like be creative about it. So I think, yeah, it's, I think it's important for me to like think about the materials we use uh, for this medium that I love so much. I think that's like, that's an important part of like the storytelling. This is is great. Well, thanks for coming on. And I mean, timing is everything. This is the first ever remote podcast we've ever done. It was something that I didn't, I had only vaguely considered. So I thank you for approaching me with the project. I'm glad to help. Yeah. And yeah, thanks everyone for watching and go, go pledge your support now. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Matthew, before we uh, bump out of here? Oh, no, man. This is great. Thanks, Reed. And yeah, really looking forward to reading it all the way through on Hemp Pepper for sure. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Peace.